Okay, good. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say uh, good morning and thank you for um, being here early and coming to attend my talk. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, a way of how we can think about data science as um, human-centered design. So um, I'll be talking specifically about um, using human-centered data science to design human connection. Um, so um, human-centered data science, there, there's a, that's a phrase to unpack, so I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but first, before we go any further, um, I'll just take a moment to introduce myself, since this is a talk about human-centered design after all. So um, I'm Lisa, I'm a data scientist at IDEO, um, which is a global design firm. Besides that, I'm also a physicist. So I got my PhD from the University of Chicago, and I've been passionate about like, the um, intersection of science and human connection for a long time. So since my first year in grad school, I've worked with an organization that helps connect young, young women with STEM mentors. So in my role as a data scientist and designer at IDEO, I work on dis interdisciplinary teams that explore the intersections of data science and design through work where we create positive impact for the clients. So IDEO is a design firm and we've been around for around 40 years at this point um, and data science is a pretty recent addition to the design work that we're, gonna, that we're doing and I'll tell you about that today. So looking ahead, what I'll be sharing with you today are two stories where we um, use data science to connect people. So I didn't pick these because they're huge data projects, but instead because they're really um, examples of uh, using human-centered data science to kind of make a translation between human needs um, and kind of uh, math and code and data science. So you'll notice as I tell these stories that they're actually pretty similar. Um, but uh, kind of unique uh, in certain aspects. Okay, but the first thing we need to do is to find what we mean by human-centered design and human-centered data science. So this might be something um, you're wondering as I keep saying it over and over again. Okay. But before I define human-centered design, I think we all need to be on the same page about what design is. So I'll share with you a definition of design that I like in particular. Um, so here we, it says that designers intentionally shape the world into something more desirable. I like this definition because it tells us that um, designers are deliberate in the choices that they make and that it reminds us that um, the things we create affect the world around us, even if it's in small ways. When I was a physicist, before I became a designer at IDEO, I considered myself as, to be someone who designed things, um, but I didn't think about myself as a designer who was kind of intentionally shaping the world. And this is a really important paradigm shift to make um, as we, you know, as we work with, with data and products that might affect a lot of people. Human-centered design is an approach that embeds empathy into the design process. So human-centered designers believe that they're making things that shape the world, but they can't figure out how things should be or how things ought to be without first understanding people's needs and context. So human-centered designers, as human-centered designers, what we do is really try to have an iterative conversation with the people that we're designing for so that we can design things, learn about their needs, and kind of tweak our designs or, or uh, fix our designs to really fit their needs in the context in which they live. So at IDEO, we practice human-centered design. Oh, good morning. Sorry, sorry, I went ahead and started. Um, so at IDEO, we practice human-centered design through um, something called design thinking. 
So there are a lot of components of design thinking, but one important aspect is that it looks for solutions at the intersections of desirability, feasibility, and viability, or really put another way, people, business, and technology. Um, so what this really leads to is a different way to scope or frame design challenges. Um, because it starts with thinking about what is desirable for people and not what we can do with technology or profitable for the business nature. So practicing human-centered design with design thinking starts with, um, starts with looking at human need and doesn't start with looking at a data set or something and figuring out um, what you could do with that. So design concepts are developed in service of human needs and then, and then only then filter through the lens of business and technology. Applying these ideas to data science, uh, we can write down some design principles for dealing with data or AI. So these are, these are emerging and kind of how we think about um, the implications of human-centered design and data science. Um, the first of these is that we don't presume that data science or AI solutions are desirable. So just because we can do something with data or AI doesn't mean it's something that we should do. Uh, we, we have to look at the needs of people first. Um, data is not true. So this, uh, I'm sure, is not a surprise to anyone who works with data. Um, but all data is created by human beings, and so the, uh, we have to be aware of the biases that are kind of inherent in the data sources that we use as we design. We uh, respect the privacy and public good. So we try to hold ourselves to a higher standard than when we get sued for doing this. And luckily, practicing human-centered design through design thinking um, kind of really helps with this aspect. And we also find that unintended consequences are actually opportunities for design. So I'll come back and give uh, a brief example of this later. Uh, so these are still emerging, but they're principles that are really core to the design work that we do at IDEO. So if I were to summarize everything that I've said so far about data science and human-centered design, the, uh, the basics would be that we don't start with data, we start with people, and we start by understanding human needs in context. But I do want to make um, the distinction that people, when I say people, it doesn't just mean the end users of the product, it means everyone that the product touches. So that's where it becomes really important to think through the potential unintended consequences. Okay, so now I've given you uh, an introduction to how we think about human-centered design and data science at IDEO, and now I'll share um, some stories of, uh, share some case studies about um, human connection and human-centered data science. So the first one of these comes from uh, a project that I did at IDEO Chicago uh, around a character called Needy the Meatbot, and um, I did this work with a fellow data scientist named Jane at IDEO. But to tell you where Meaty came from it requires me to give you some background information um, on where, there's some more detail about where exactly I'm working from. So before I worked at IDEO, I worked at a small human-centered data science consultancy in downtown Chicago called Data Scale. And as of October 2017, or um, about a year ago, IDEO um, Datascope joined forces with IDEO, this company that I've been talking about so far. So back in October of last year, um, Datascope was acquired by IDEO, and our around 20 employees joined the IDEO Chicago studio um, that had around 60 employees, um, and they were also hiring a lot at this time, so the, the studio was growing really rapidly. And you can imagine that um, as these two companies started joining together, uh, it really became a challenge to get to know everybody as we were, we were kind of joining the studios. 
And one of the things that we started wondering as this process was happening was how we might facilitate a stronger community um, between these two merging companies. So there are many ways to tackle this problem, and most of them probably don't have a lot to do with data science or data. Um, the particular solution that we chose to focus on was sending coworkers to lunch together. This was originally the idea of uh, our experience director, Annette Ferreira. So they had tried something like this before. Um, about two years before, they had a studio-wide initiative that um, sent pairs of people out to lunch together. Um, However, most of the scheduling and pairing tasks fell to um, Diz, who is one of our leadership coordinators at IDEO. You can imagine that pairing and scheduling lunches for even 50 or 60 people is very difficult, and if not impossible, and not many of the lunches actually ended up happening. So we looked at this um, and we looked at the needs of our studio currently, and we started wondering whether we could help with this um, using data science in some way. So the way this concept ended up coming to life was through a program called Meeting Threes, where groups of three people would go to lunch together. So we decided to see if we could actually assign optimal groups of Chicago idea to go to lunch together um, in groups of three and actually automatically schedule that time for them um, so that the events would be more likely to happen for the entire studio once a month. So we had our concept, but the, the next thing we really needed to do was look into think about how even this like seemingly simple concept uh, could actually shape the world. So we wanted to think of through um, the unintended, what could be the potential unintended consequences of this initiative. So, some consequences that you might imagine for even something like this include financial Im implications and time implications for the people involved. So we were wondering, um, are we actually putting a burden on people on the staff if we're asking them to go to lunch with their colleagues if they have to pay for their own lunch? Um, Maybe there's a reason that people work through lunch sometimes. Maybe they're trying to get home or later. So we, we thought about these things. And um, we designed into, so we designed into the program that financial support would be provided for the lunches and that we would allow people to opt out easily. So this isn't something that you have to do. So the next task is to really figure out what we mean by optimal groups. Our method was to develop a score for each group um, with the potential variables being design disciplines. So we have a lot of different kinds of designers, from interaction designers to industrial designers to electrical engineers, and all of these people have different expertise, um, to projects that they might have worked on together, to things like seniority, seniority and higher date shared interests. So uh, we were able to get uh, all this data about people by scraping our internal, um, our ideal internal website. So we have a website where everyone can maintain their own um, personal pages. So once we decided on the method of um, defining a score, the next thing we asked, we asked what makes a group good? So to get an idea of how important the different variables that we had access to were, we uh, worked with Annette and Diz to define what makes a group good. So what I'm showing you on the right is one of the sessions that we did with Annette and Diz where we actually, um, one of the most important things we did for this was print out everyone's pictures um, so that we can kind of sift through and and make groups and talk, so talk about like what makes the group good or a bad group. So some design tips for this um, is that it's a good idea to kind of get tangible and iterate with the people um, you're designing with. 
through doing this, we found that um, figuring out or assigning optimal groups was actually pretty simple. Um, we just need to look at a wide range of design disciplines, seniority, and we want to get people who don't know each other well so they haven't worked on projects together. We thought about our optimization needs. So we have the groups for we want to optimize for an entire month at a time. But how precise do we need to get with this? In this case, our stakes aren't very high. We just need to send people to lunch. So we just need a, a rough <coughs> optimization. And our method was to just generate groups randomly, one group at a time, um, until each person has one or two lunches and to check each score against a minimum as we, um, as we kind of generate those groups. So um, we'll just, I'll just show how uh, this works in practice to get a better idea about how this works. So let's say we generated this group um, of a data scientist, a support staff, and a communications designer. Um, we have three design disciplines, a seniority range of one, and these people haven't actually worked together before. So they might have a score. Uh, so their score um, with our scoring method is a 0.85, which is above our minimum value, so we would go ahead and accept that group. If uh, we generated, next we might generate a group that looks like this. So you see that it's similar to other groups, except they've all worked on a lot of projects together. So in this case, um, this group gets rejected, and we would generate another group um, that might be a better be a better fit. So we would accept that group. So so I mean we just do this until we have um, a, a whole month assignment at one time. And then once we have um, a group assignment, we use the Google Calendar API to go in and get a list of free and busy times for everyone um, in each group so we can find the time for them to actually meet together. Um, these, uh, the time structure isn't uniform for these, so we used uh, a, an in-house uh, kind of uh, library in Python uh, that was developed for um, working with uneven time series called Traces. Okay, so what was the outcome of this uh, seemingly simple initiative? After three months, we had um, assigned over, uh, we had assigned around 112 group lunches for people in the studio. And um, this tool actually was surprisingly useful, um, not just in the Chicago IDEO studio, but in the Chicago um, global studios. So, uh, we had people from several different studios and design disciplines approaching us and asking us if we could help them group people and um, assign times for them to meet. So we actually were able to connect IDOers from all the different studios. Uh, and we have studios all over the world in Shanghai, Tokyo, um, you know, in the US. In, in all, after three months of 160 unique people had actually attended the thought events to connect with each other. But um, the, these are kind of numbers about how, um, how this, this developed. But there was actually something that we, uh, you know, there was actually a real feeling of enhanced community in the Chicago studio. And uh, we saw this cultural phenomenon happening where um, as people were going to lunch together, they would upload selfies of, of themselves onto our Slack so that you know everyone could really participate in these in these events. So these outcomes weren't just quantitative. There was a meaningful sense of enhanced community. So that was the first um, story of human-centered data science. So what we really saw there was um, a real life situation where by just looking at the human needs, we were able to come up with a creative use of data science. 
And the second story I'm going to tell you today comes from, um, is, is pretty similar to that, and it comes from work with one of our clients, which was uh, the Research Corporation for Scientific Advancement, or R RCSA. And this is about um, a conference that they have, that they hold, um, called Scilog. Uh, this work was largely, the work I'm going to talk to you about with this was largely done by uh, one of my colleagues named Brian Lang. For some background, RCSA, um, they run a conference called Scilog that I referred to before. These are held at Biosphere 2 in Tucson, Arizona. So um, that's what the picture on the right is shown from. So you can see it's a very beautiful place that they have these conferences. So they're, whole, they're held with the goal of connecting people um, across the different silos of science to work on pressing topics and form new collaborative teams. They have big picture across disciplinary topics and what they really want to encourage is um, people from different science disciplines working together. So these conferences are unconventional in a few ways. Attendees are mostly junior and they typically don't have tenure yet, um, but they're doing really good research. Um, and they're invite only, and the reason for this is because they want to get a good balance of people who are doing relevant research to the topics. So um, the way, the real way, like, that these conferences are um, unconventional is that most of the time isn't really um, spent in the dynamic that we have right now with the audience speaker dynamic. Uh, most of the time that these conferences are actually spent in breakout discussion groups. Um, and finally, these conferences are, they're tied to grant awards. So if you find someone at one of these conferences that you really want to work with, you can submit a research proposal to RCSA and you can actually get that research funded um, with a grant. So here are those cross-disciplinary topics um, that they work on at those conferences and the year that they happen. Datascope has actually been working with RCSA uh, for a long time, I think maybe since 2010 or 2011. Um, and at first, we were just aiming to measure the outcome of the conference. So to see how well they worked. But we realized that if we could measure the outcome, we could also actively improve it. And that's what I'm going to tell you about um, the efforts for doing that. So we know that if we want to measure or improve something, we need to quantify it. So how can we actually quantify um, how connected people are? What we did was to classify um, connections between people into four different categories. So the first one is unaware. So these are people who have never heard of each other. The second level is awareness. So you might, um, this might be when someone has heard something about someone else or they've read something, but uh, they have never actually spoken to them and these connections can be directional. Um, the next level up is when people um, have discussed something. So this means a meaningful discussion about science. And finally, uh, the level of collaboration. So these are people who have co-authored something or worked together, and these are the kind of connections we actually want to create. This was a pretty small conference, and obviously a data set for this didn't exist before um, conference started, so we had to create one. And the data collection was pretty simple and was done in the form of a survey. So before each, before the conference, um, each attendee gives this survey and they blurt out um, things on the left are the names of every other attendee, and they um, kind of just fill out how well they know each other. Uh, they actually also fill out one of these one year after the conference, and that's what we'll be comparing it to. So I mentioned the format was unusual and was spent in breakout groups. These are actually done in three different sessions during the day. So the conference attendees are broken into groups of four and they're uh, put in discussion groups. But um, an interesting thing is they actually aren't given a topic and they're free to talk about whatever they want. 
So to optimize these groups, we might start by asking whether or not this is a good group. And uh, we, we look at how connected it is and assign these a score once again. So um, awareness connections, we give a score of one. Discussion connections, a score of two. And collaboration connections, a score of four. So this time a high score is a bad thing, and we, uh, we call this the, the terribleness score of this group, maybe a little bit more pessimistic than the last um, thing we looked at. And so this group is pretty connected, and we know that we can just fix this by uh, swapping out one of the people in the group, and now the terribleness score is much lower. So what we want to do is kind of is minimize that terribleness score over all three batches of the conference, uh, all three um, breakout groups in the conference and all the batches. So if we think about our optimization this time, our, our stakes are a little bit higher than lunch because we're actually tying these, uh, the outcome of this conference to grand awards. Unfortunately, optimization in this case isn't so straightforward. So on the, um, on the right, um, I'm showing you uh, the results of just trying to kind of swap out one person at a time in this group and optimize it that way. And you can see that this is a quite, this is not a monotonically decreasing function or anything. It's quite, um, yeah. The method that we used here uh, is, was simulating simulated annealing. So this is a stochastic optimization technique um, that introduces randomness to avoid local minima. And um, I'll just run through that technique quickly. So the algorithm for simulated annealing is pretty simple, but a little bit more complicated than the one we used for the meat example. Um, <coughs> there, are few, there are only a few variables in it. Uh, one that we've seen before called the, terrible, the terribleness, uh, which was our, our combined score of all the groups. And uh, we're introducing another one called temperature. <coughs> so in this case, temperature is our willingness to explore this landscape. Um, so as the temperature lowers, we, we get less willing to explore um, as we get closer to our, our, our actual solution. So now when we're optimizing, we'll first assign everyone to, um, to groups, and then we'll calculate uh, the terribleness score. And the first thing we do is we'll make a random change so we'll take two people and we swap them and calculate our new terribleness score. So we check to see if this is this state is better than the previous one. If it is, we take we keep it and we go ahead and make another switch um, between two other people. But if it's a not if it's not, there's a chance that we'll still keep this this group because. Um, you can imagine in this landscape that we're looking to optimize on that the minimum might fall across another uh, you know, peak in that landscape. So there's a chance that we'll still keep it. The temperature is high. So in this case, we're more willing to take risks like this and we do decide to keep this one. Um, and we just keep doing this and, um, until the temperature reaches a um, a lower, like a, a threshold value, and that's what we call the optimal uh, group assignments. So the way this actually ends up looking like, uh, I'll show you in this animation, which was actually taken and modified from Wikipedia. So you can see in the beginning, uh, it's moving around a lot, but as the temperature decreases, uh, it moves around less, and eventually settles on the minimum. So once we optimize the groups, um, what was the outcome? So in actually 30 of the 39 group discussions, none of the people knew each other or had even heard of each other before they attended the conference. And in all the group discussions, no one had collaborated with anyone else in the group. So if the goal is to get people to meet new people, um, this was very effective. Uh, the groups were also very diverse in terms of 
scientific disciplines and uh, theorists versus experimentalist expertise. Here's a picture of what those conference attendees looked like as far as their connections when they were coming into the conference. And at one year after the conference, uh, this is what it looked like. So they're actually much more connected than they were when they came in. The conference had been running for many years at this point, um, but using this method, they actually received the most collaborative proposals that they'd ever received after um, a conference. There were 118 new conversations, and 17 of those proposals actually turned into um, new collaborations. So 17 might not sound like a lot, but this was a pretty small conference, so this meant that 54% of the attendees actually formed a new collaboration with um, someone they met at the conference. So now I'll talk a little bit about what was common to both of the stories that I told today. Um, and that is that there was a human need in each case. Uh, in this case, it was the same human need, meaning to connect people to each other. And the job of the data scientist was really to see that human need and translate it into math or code. We used iterative problem solving in both cases. So this involved starting by asking what the need was and generating ideas around that, building prototypes quickly, evaluating the solutions with um, our stakeholders, and kind of just doing that um, in iteration with um, the people that we're designing for. This iterative problem solving technique, we did optimization of the groups, but this iterative problem solving technique is also an optimization algorithm. So now that we've gone over these stories, what can we learn from them? here that optimization isn't just for straightforward mathematical problems or something you might think of applying it to um, if you're just thinking about things with math problems. And we saw that data science isn't just for mathematical problems. I think that human-centered data scientists are like human-centered data science can help you unlock creative approaches to many real-world problems. And the job of a data scientist or a human-centered data scientist is actually to act as a translator between the human needs and the, uh, the data science application. Uh, so that's my talk, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.
was performed with the main point of contact on the client team. So um, different scores we were tried out. We would show him the groups developed by those scores and he would get feedback and the score would be adjusted. So um, so that's how kind of the iterative, iterative problem solving is also an optimization. So those scores were the result of the, of the process you're describing. And my question was, even after all that, yeah. was there still the need for the human to look at them and say, yep, those look good, or did you get such an appropriate score that you just put them on? Well, actually, for, for me, for me and me, but we actually do look at it, so it's only like, it's about 30 groups a month, so we do look at it and, and like, make some swi manual switches in cases that it doesn't look so good. Um, I'm not actually sure about the RCSA example, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, but uh, it's, it, it does, I mean, uh, the, the scoring technique in the automatic generation does get you quite a long way in it, uh, so it's much faster than if you try to assign all that yourself. Does that help? Yeah. 